Go to another city for a meetup. Well, here, I, you know, we came from Boston. And it was like, oh yeah, that's a four and a half hour bus drive, that's fine. Um, is that funny thing between America and Europe? Where if we say that's far away in Europe, we mean an hour and a half. But if we say old, we mean like at least like a thousand years. And here it's the other way around, where people go like, oh yeah, no, it's not that far away. They mean six hours. Then when they say it's old, they mean like, oh yeah, it's 50 years. Now, people say the Empire State Building is old. I'm like, that thing is, like, my garden shed is older than the Empire State Building. Um, so, yeah, um, that, that is sort of a big, I think that's the biggest difference. What were uh, the biggest challenges getting to the point now? The biggest challenge that we had, so the biggest challenge that we had to deal with ever was ourselves. Um, we are stubborn, we are passionate and we wanted to make video games. So what we did is we stubbornly and passionately made video games. Um, which sounds like a great idea, but it also means that you forget to take care of yourself. And um, for the first few months of Lambry, that was great. Because we worked really hard, we did a lot of things, we made a lot of games, everything was wonderful, and then we got cloned. And that was the first time something really went bad. But at that point, we were so emotionally and physically exhausted that just that, like, just that one bunch took us out for over a year. Um, it turns out that emotions are actually a pretty big deal um, when you're making things. Um, it doesn't sound like it because you look at, you know, you look at game, you look at game development, and you see programs, you see code, you see logic, you see models, you see poly counts, edge loops, that sort of stuff, right? But if you're going to make something of your own, the thing you're going to be dealing with most is yourself, because that's the only source you have for what you're making. And even though you put that through all of those programs, it's still you that has to do it. And it turns out that creativity is fragile. Everybody has a thing that they sort of get inspiration from, something, something inside that they, that they build on. They don't really know what it is until you lose it, I guess. Because we were like, oh, well, we'll just make video games. And then we got depressed. And it was like, oh, shit, we can't make video games. Because we just opened, like, I would literally open my computer start up uh, whatever I was programming in, and then you stare at the screen for an hour or four, while every now and then going to Twitter, and then going to Facebook, and then back to Twitter, and then to Facebook. And then I check my Gmail and get depressed at how many emails I had to answer. Um, and then back to the cursor, and that was my day. And I did that for six months, before we almost stopped and gave up on video games. Um, and we're like, you know what, screw it, we're just gonna make, we're just gonna make a game. And that was Luftrausse, and that sort of was like, okay, you know, we can still make games. It's interesting because you look at Luftrausse, um, Flammery games are happy games. And it's not like they're happy, happy games. They're games that we made while we were happy, and you can sort of feel it. And like, if you play a Flammery game, that's like, it, it makes you feel good. Um, and that's because we felt good while making it. So for Luftrausse, when you play it, you feel angry. I feel angry when I'm playing Luftrausse. I'm just like I'm like this close to like shouting at my computer all the time. Um, and that's because we were angry when we were making it. And that's a really interesting like it's a tiny little difference, but you can feel it. You can feel it in the game, which is really interesting. I've been sort of fascinated by Luftrausse for that reason. I'll take one from that side. Oh, having your game closed, how do you feel about? How do I feel about cloning? So here's the thing. People say cloning is the most sincere form of flattery, right? Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. I, I can live with that. When people say, you know, if somebody tries to do something that you're doing, that's pretty cool. If people get inspired and, you know, build on what you're making, that's pretty cool. Um, there's a difference, though, when somebody sits down on one computer has your game, on the computer, other computer has their game, and just look like, okay, is this exactly the same? Is this exactly? And we can actually tell that they did that, because the speed at which the hook moves from left to right in Ninja Fishing is identical to the movement speed of the hook that we have on the PC version. Which is stupid, because that was a PC version, and the only reason that delay was there was because the mouse, you can move your mouse like this, that would break the game, so we put in that delay. Well, on the iPad, it's actually kind of nice to just be able to do this and the hook moves like that. Um, so they just copy that because they don't know how to make games. They know how to copy games. 
which I always thought was funny. We pointed that out to them. They're like, eh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, I think they're like cloning as an educational exercise to learn how to make video games is one of the best ways to learn. Like, pick a game you like, try to rebuild it. I've been doing that thing, uh, me and a friend of mine uh, have both sort of decided to clone Flappy Bird, not to release it, but just for the hell of it. And that game is pretty complex. Like, it looks like it's really simple, but there's so many like little tricks going on that you're like, oh, okay, okay, there's more to this than meets the eye. And going through that process and seeing why designers took certain decisions is really interesting. I think why is the most interesting question you can ask anyway. Um, why do certain things work this way? Why am I implementing this way and not another way? Um, I think why is the difference between accepting things as they are and making a conscious decision? And I think as a designer, that is your, that's your tool. Your tool is making decisions. That's what we do. That's all we do. We try and make the most informed decision that we can. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I feel about cloning like I feel about pretty much everything. It's not completely black and white, but if you're doing it for purely cynical reasons to make a shit ton of money, then I hope that doesn't work out. If you're making it to learn something, or to try and improve or something, or to you know see what certain people did to get to a certain design, hell yeah, go for it. How often do quality and monetization conflict? Well, it depends on your model. Um, so in most models, that is actually not that much of a, of a problem. It gets, it gets problematic in like, you know, triple A. Um, because we're at a point where a $60 game, or uh, what, how much is a triple A game here? 60? Shit, we get ripped off in Europe. There's 60 euro in Europe. That's like $75. Um, that's, that's a, that sounds like a lot of money, but if you think, if you look at the budgets for those games, that's actually not all that much money. Um, so there, there's actually a problem there with, you know, what can we do, how much money do we have, and there's a bunch of games being released right now that actually just have terrible frame rate, not because particularly, like, reasons beyond, beyond, like, the reason is simply they need to push big hardware and they don't have enough time to make it proper. So that's, that's one side of it. Making a game for two ninety nine means that you can't spend a million dollars on the game unless you're going to sell five, like 300,000 of them. Um, so there's a thing. Um, and in, um, in our purchases, with in our purchases, it sort of related to how politely do you implement your in-app purchases? And if you're going to implement them politely, how OK are you with not earning any money? Um, because in-app purchases don't seem to work when you do them politely. Um, I think they are sort of close, but not per se. I think if you look at the game, if you look at the game industry, there are a whole lot of games that have no income, that are actually really, really good. Uh, some of my favorite games last year were less than ten dollars. Um, Papers, please, was like what ten? Uh, that was probably my favorite games last year. So there, I don't think that there is necessarily. Like, there, there's not necessarily a link, but just there can be, and I think that is something you should avoid when you start working on a game, scope correctly, check your budget, check how much time you have. Think of money as time. That's, that's, the, biggest, that's the biggest tip I can give anybody is. <laughs> so, you know when you start a company, uh, as a student per se, you don't have a lot of money, right? Because you're starting a company. And what ends up happening is you look at money the way a student looks at money. So you go to like the supermarket and you go like, wow, this bottle of Coca-Cola is like, what? What is a bottle of Coca-Cola? Two, two something? Two dollars. Oh, we get super ripped off in this. <laughs> um, so you, you, you buy a bottle of Coca-Cola and you're like, wow, that's, you know, that's a bit expensive. Maybe I should look for something cheaper. Um, so they're dealing with a company and they go like, you know what, for this game we'll pay you 30,000. You're like, that's a lot of Coca-Cola bottles. <laughs> nice. Um, and then you look at how long can I run my studio and it's like, oh, that's not that much. And that's a really interesting problem you're going to run into because your sense of money is wrong. 
Um, that 30,000, that's a reference I made to um, another deal we did with Adult Swim. And we had negotiations and people were like, oh no, you got 10,000 for your first game, so you should ask for way more. And we're like, well, we, like, what? And they're like, well, you know, we're like 30,000 or something. We're like, well, that sounds like a lot of money, but sure, we'll ask. So I went to Adult Swim, we sat down and they said, so how much do you want for the game? We said, 30,000. And they said, okay. <laughs> That's the worst outcome for negotiations you can have. <laughs> um, the, best, the best outcome is, oh, no, no, that's too much. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the good one. Because there's nobody that goes like, that's too much, I'm never talking to you again. That doesn't happen. Like, always aim way too high. Just, like, overshoot. But, like, as much as you can. If you make them upset, you're doing it right. <laughs> um, but, you know, we thought 30,000 was a big deal, but then Adult Swim is owned by, like, Time Warner. They have a bunch of money, they don't care, 30,000 is like pocket change. They're like, oh yeah, we need a game about dinosaurs, can you do that? Like, yeah. They're like, how's you want? 30,000. They're like, wow, cool, these guys are doing it on the cheap. <laughs> so, when you think about money, like, don't forget who you're talking to. If you're talking to a starving, like, audio person, like, somewhere, we have an audio, we have an artist just across the border in, in Canada. Um, we're not, gonna be, we're not gonna be mean and say like, oh no, you're getting like $744.30 because that's exactly what fits in our budget. We're gonna be nice. We're gonna like give them a bit more. If we're talking to a big company though, we will get every single cent we can get from them before we make a deal because that's what they would do to us as well. That, that was a pretty okay answer. <laughs> Well, so step number one was we made a free video game. Um, that worked really well because it was a good video game. Um, and we could have actually earned money with it, but we sort, of, we sort of sat down and we said, okay, if you sell this game for like, say, $10, because back in the days you could ask $10 for Super Great Box, um, how much are we gonna sell? And we were like, oh, 500 to 1,000. Like, All right, that's, 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 that's 10,000, that's pretty good. How many people will download it? If we make it, um, then the interesting thing of that was the interesting thing was that one of those was um, Kotaku. They wrote about it, and then everybody picked it up because it wasn't Kotaku. People were like, "Oh, no, Kotaku's writing. We should write about this." Uh, that's how news works. Um, that's why all those little hoax articles always end up being headline news. And they're like, "Oh no, they're saying it. They're trustworthy. Let's just copy paste this," um, which was great for us because it meant that Super Great Box was suddenly everywhere. And through that attention, we ended up getting, um, getting enough confidence to submit it to IGF, which was, by the way, that, like the, having enough confidence to submit is sort of a weird concept, like just submit it anyway. Um, if it's free, there's no reason not to submit. If it's paid, there is a reason not to submit, and it is only the money. Um, because at worst, you're not gonna get nominated, and at least you know there's something wrong. And in, best, in most cases, you can actually ask for feedback. In the best case, you get nominated. It's not real, there's no lose situation. There's nobody gonna be like, this game is so awful, I'm never gonna check it out again. Like, like people are so scared of, of doing things. Like, I don't know what that is, because making video games is already making yourself pretty darn vulnerable. Like, just by itself, because essentially you're trying to have a dialogue with a player, and the player can just go like, this game is shit. <laughs> One star on green light, bye. Like, that's, that's, that's something that can happen. So making a game by default is already sort of a vulnerability, and then people go like, ah, I'm not gonna send it to the press because the game's not done yet. We, I sent my first build, like the first build we make, we send it to press, and we're like, this still looks like shit, it sounds like shit, but hey, this is what we're gonna be working on, what do you think? And they're like, uh, it looks like prototype. And we're like, it is. Um, and then every now and then at events, I'll just go like, grab a laptop and be like, remember that prototype I sent you? And they're like, yeah, well, this is what it looks like now. Like, oh, cool. Um, so we start sending stuff immediately. Um, and sure, you can wait until it looks a bit better. I think it's typically Flambeer to just send prototypes and be like, hey, look, it's cubes. Isn't that great? Um, but, you know, find your own voice in that, but do it. Like, just go and do it. Like, go to every event that you can possibly afford. Go and mail every member of the press. Go and email every hero you have in the industry with a build of your game. Like everything you do that gets people to play the game or see the game gets you exposure, and the more exposure you have, the easier it is to get more. Another cool ringtone. <laughs> oh, that was short. <laughs> What's a skill that like, you picked up while working when making games that player that you didn't expect to pick up at all? Or, like, or just something that 
Uh, pretty much everything I do nowadays. I, I started Flambeer as a programmer, and that was what I wanted to do, and that was what I knew how to do. Then at Flambeer, I learned how to do marketing, I learned how to do public speaking, I learned how to do business, I learned how to do accountancy, I learned how to read legal documents, I learned how to present my games at events, I learned how to pitch, which is one of the most important things that you can possibly know if you're making a video. You know, who here is making a video game? Somebody is going to be in trouble. You. Can you tell me, in, yeah, you, um, no, the, the, the black shirt, um, what is your video game? Uh, we're making, a, it's a, called the <laughs> Robo Ruckus. Sorry? <laughs> it's called Robo Ruckus, it's over there in the corner. Yeah. And what it's, is it? It's basically um, a game where you connect with your phone and you can connect on the internet and have it on a, a large screen and you can co-op play. We have mini games and, and uh, Okay. Puzzles you can play with, with people. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the rest of you. Does any of you know what the game is? No? Is anybody interested in trying it? Uh, that, was not, that was not a particularly good pitch. It wasn't a good pitch because it didn't answer the three <laughs> questions that I wanted. And I know this is unfair. I'm just dumping this on you. Um, so the three questions I want to know is, what is your game? Which you didn't tell me, you just told me I could connect things to a screen. Um, why are you making it? Which you didn't tell me because you only told me I can connect to a screen. And um, why are you the right person to be making this? Which you didn't tell me because you only told me you can connect to a screen. Um, so, okay, some of you have a bit more preparation now. Who's making a video game? Aww. <laughs> Aww. Come on, who's making a video game? Alright, you. Go. Well, I make this game called the Maze. It's basically a puzzle game where you're playing a robot who's lost and has to find his way out of this crazy world. He's got to escape deadly traps, solve puzzles, build bridges and blocks and stuff like that. Basically, I'm just using it to showcase this engine I've started working on since the summer and I've been building up from pretty much scratch. And I would say that it's been a lot of fun building it and it's really starting to reach a point where you can sort of see the mechanics of themselves coming out. A lot of the art and stuff is just placeholders, but it's really starting to get somewhere, I think. Do you think that was a good pitch? Better? Yeah? Who would, who would give that a go? See? Um, it's not that hard. You just answer those three questions in a few lines. And most people know their game so well that if you take, like, if I would give you 30 more seconds, you would be able to pitch just the same thing. Here's the thing. You want to be able to do this when this happens. Because I know a lot of people in the industry, I know a lot of people in the press, if, I, um, if you tell me about your game and I go like, huh, okay, I can connect it to a screen. Sure. If you tell me this is an interesting game about a robot where you do all these things, I'm going to be like, okay, I'd like to check that out. And maybe I'll go and talk to somebody from the press and be like, oh, I played this game back in Vermont. It was called this and this. So essentially, if one of your teammates grabs a like, bucket of ice cold water and you're asleep and they throw it in your face and go, what is your video game? <laughs> you need to be able to say that in three lines. Because that's about the time anybody's going to give you. Because after three sentences, people are like, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Yeah, no, that sounds awful. Yeah, do you have a business card? That essentially, do you have a business card? This business speak for this conversation is over. Give me your card so I can forget it. Um, do have business cards though. Like that's not always the case, but usually people use it to just, like get rid of a conversation. Um, at least I do. Uh, <laughs> If I grab your business card at the beginning of a conversation, that's good. If I grab it, if I ask for it at the end of a conversation, that's probably a problem. Um, but pitching is such a crucial skill. So many games we made happen because, like literally, I was waiting in line to get food, and I was talking to the person next to me in line, and it's been like, oh, you make video games? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're looking for video games. Like, okay, well, so we have this idea for a game in which you run a dinosaur zoo, and the idea is that you build up this zoo, but the dinosaurs get angry if you put them too close, but every day you get a new dinosaur, so at the end, everything goes to hell. <laughs> that's enough to get people to laugh. It's also enough to get people interested. And that's a pitch that I practiced on for like, what? A few days? Let's go like, okay. 
just think of it as a mathematical equation, right? Everything that doesn't need to be there, you get rid of it. Everything that you can simplify, you simplify it. It's that simple. You just take unnecessary words out. You make every word that you can find better. Until eventually it's a good pitch. It's a basic skill that everybody should have. It doesn't really depend on whether you're a programmer or a musician or the business person or the audio person because you don't know who of you is going to end up talking to the person with the big bag of money or who works in the press. You never know. Everybody in a project should be able to do this. More questions? How much time do I have? Oh, I have some minutes. How do you stay creative? So here's, here's, here's my three rules for staying creative. Um, one, make video games. Sit down, make video games. Game a week, game jams. I'm going to be on a train jam soon. It's a game jam on a train from <laughs> Chicago to San Francisco um, for GDC. It's awesome. Um, make a lot of games. Just sit down, make games. Um, stay interested. Then don't make games. Play games, play games with other people, discuss, discuss games, read books, watch documentaries, listen to music, try and get your inspiration from somewhere else than other video games. And three, go skydiving. Um, and I don't literally mean go skydiving, I just mean go do something that you would never do otherwise. Uh, because a lot of creativity is based on perspective. The more information you have in here, the more, the more interesting ways you have to mix it together. The more interesting ways to mix information together, the more creative you are. When somebody says everything is a remix, they don't mean everything is take this from this game and this from this game, mash it together and you've got ninja fishing. What they mean is everything that you make is a result of the information that you have in your head. If it isn't in your head, you can't mix it. It can be tiny, it can be a thing like a shot in a documentary and a discussion about duck hunt. That made our first money. If we didn't have those two pieces of information in our head, we would not been, I would not be here. But because I just went like, oh, fuck it, I'll watch a documentary about tuna overfishing. That sounds interesting. We made radical fishing. So the more, the more you do, the more different, interesting, weird, unexpected things you do, the more things you do outside of what you would normally do, the more books you read, the more movies you watch, the more shitty B movies you watch, like the more everything. The more everything, the more creative you are. Do you think about who you're making the game for, or do you assume they're all like, pretty much you? Um, I think one of the interesting things about being an independent developer is that um, my audience isn't necessarily me, but they definitely like me or what I do. Um, so we, I mean, there's no way to make a game without thinking of the player. Like, the player is always central, right? It's, like, it's what we build for. Games are not about... I mean, yes, sure, games are about art. Games are about code. Games are about audio. But in the end, games are about interactivity. That's what's at the core of a video game. That's what makes video games special. That's why, when you read a book, you discuss the main character in terms of this person did that and that. And when you talk about a movie, you say, like, Bruce Willis kicked a terrorist of a flat. When you talk about a video game, you say, I jumped over the gap. Like that I is really important because you can write a book where people keep saying I, but you will never believe that's you because you know it isn't. When you're playing a video game, it is you. As a designer, that connection there is one of the most valuable things you have because that's what makes games unique. That's what makes games special. That's why people get so invested in games, why they identify. So yes, we always think about our player. We always think about how are they going to approach this? Is the UI confusing? Can we get a random person on the train to try radical fishing, uh, ridiculous fishing for us? Um, see what they do wrong. Like, you're always focusing on the player. But we do kind of trust that if we 